I saw him just as a as a real fan, as a real supporter. Everyone will say that, and that's what um, that's what he was. When I first met him, I realised the enthusiasm that he had for Chelsea, but it was through the eyes of a of a fan always, not as an investor or looking to be anything else. Um, he had a real passion for Chelsea. He was a fan, you know, from a very young age, and then he got all the way up. He was part, of, on, obviously, on the terraces with the fans, and then obviously he got onto the board when Ken Bates was here. But his name is still even sung at times today, really, like Matthew Harding. Having the Matthew Harding stand was a fantastic idea. People will never forget him because he was a fan, and mostly that's the most important thing you can say, being a fan of Chelsea Football Club. Can you see he lived and breathed Chelsea? So it was infectious, really. So you had no choice. You know, we were going home and away, watching Chelsea. It became our lives, really. We had the kids' shirts when we were younger, and uh, just grew up with the Chelsea, uh, the Chelsea crest, all over our bedrooms. He was totally passionate and dedicated and obsessed with Chelsea. Whilst he had a lot of money, and he was very passionate, and he wanted to help the club at heart, he was a hundred percent supporter. A 2-1 defeat to Bolton at Burnden Park was the last Chelsea match that Matthew Harding ever saw. Tragically, he never returned home. Air accident investigators have begun the inquiry into the crash, which killed Chelsea co-owner Matthew Harding and four others. The French twin-engine helicopter came down just before 11pm. It quickly became clear that it had been en route to London from Chelsea's match at Bolton. It's still vivid in the uh, memory. Uh, we talked in the boardroom after the match and the, what turned out to be the last conversation with uh, Matthew and his words were, oh dear, we've lost, we've now got to win the FA Cup, put in rather more colourful uh, language than that. And then as the night went on, it was obvious the helicopter, air helicopter had crashed but we weren't sure whether it was uh, Matthew and his uh, uh, friends and as the night progressed, it became pretty obvious that uh, it was a helicopter, although no one was confirming it. And I got home about five in the morning and never slept. And by seven o'clock in the morning, uh, various journalists and people were ringing my home uh, number, wanting to speak to me, but really checking whether I was still alive, because on many occasions uh, I travelled with uh, Matthew on his private uh, jet to uh, matches uh, all over the uh, UK. And on that occasion, I decided that I'd go on the coach because uh, uh, Linda, who is now my ex-wife, decided she wanted to go to the match. So under those circumstances, I didn't go with him on the, uh, the helicopter. Dreadful funeral to go to, it really was. We should never have been going to that funeral at his age and the enthusiasm and the, you know, he has for life. And, and it was very sad. I still remember the number of bouquets and flowers at Stamford Bridge and the fact that the next game went ahead against uh, Tottenham. And as Alan Sugar said to me after the match, we never had a chance today. They were absolutely, the crowd just carried the team through to win 3-1. Win when Chairman Ken Bates called for investment in 1993, Matthew Harding saw no better way to use his fortunes than invest in his beloved club. It saw him change from season ticket holder to board member, a move that put him in the public eye for the first time. It just changed overnight, really. I mean, we went from just coming to games, getting the train up, going to the Imperial beforehand, walking into the stadium, and just as, as a normal fan, really. And then overnight, People wanted to talk to him. They wanted to come up and shake his hand and ask him about Chelsea and get in a conversation with him, really. When we sat down when I first met him, um, you could see his ambitions were to keep himself as a fan, but to get himself in at the board level to try and take, to take Chelsea up to the levels where he wanted them to go. And he, see, he could see where they could go. And I, I think he felt me coming to the club at that time, I had, I had them ambitions to, to, to take the club up to another level and I think they sort of matched each other and um, that was why we probably gelled and, went and got on very well. 
First of all, he got the redevelopment going by putting up the uh, money for what now is the uh, Matthew Harding stand. We had a meeting, Glenn, Matthew Harding and Ken Bates and I all met, came up with the idea that we should uh, try and uh, change the image of Chelsea and go for some bigger names. So we would use the benefits of Bosman and go for established names to try and raise the profile and the success of the team and really uh, established uh, the most successful era after the uh, 1970s in the history of Chelsea before the Abramovich years. The mid-90s saw some big names come to Stamford Bridge, including European Cup winner Rude Hullet. Glenn and I went to um, Italy and got Rude Hullet. Uh, and then, of course, on the back of that, Mark Hughes came in, and then the ball uh, started uh, rolling. You know, Matthew got as excited as anyone, as a fan, to really... He said, I'm pinching myself, Glenn. He said, I'm pinching myself. I remember him. And we really got... Rude Hullet is coming, yeah. It was a very exciting time for the club, wasn't it? It was probably when money first started coming into football, I'd say, really, and foreign players were coming into the Premiership. And um, it was really a shame because he missed out on that, really, because he, he died sort of shortly after. And that's when we started the success, when we had the FA Cup with Middlesbrough, and from there we won trophy after trophy. And he never really got to see that side of Chelsea. After his death, there were a lot of stories in the media that Chelsea wouldn't have the, uh, the money uh, to go out and buy players and of course in the November I went out and signed uh, Zola which uh, again probably if Matthew's influence hadn't been in the background maybe the money wouldn't have been found to to buy Zola for over four million pounds. It was his vision, passion and energy that endeared him to many he met none more so than manager Glenn Hoddle. The odd occasion when Matthew would give me a phone it would just be a phone call from out the blue Glenn I'd like you to come down to London and uh, we'll have lunch. I said, I can't, Matthew, I've got plans this afternoon. We're, we're doing, don't worry about them. He said, I want to talk about the vision I've got for Chelsea going forward. I said, Matthew, I in the end, OK, I'll see you there at one o'clock. So I have to drive back down here. I sat there and we, we, I, I listened to his vision. And, and when he starts going, you could see the passion coming out of him. He had a beautiful saying, a lovely saying, which reminded me of um, Dudley Moore out of Arthur. He used to turn around to me and he used to say things like, uh, it's great being me. <laughs> and I used to love that. It's great being me, he used to say, bless him. I remember one away game I went to at QPR and we were in the director's box or, or something and like there's all pictures, of, I've got pictures of me and Vinnie Jones and Graham Asaho and Kerry Dixon and it became a bit surreal, you know, because you've been used to being the normal fan and then suddenly you're like, oh my God. Former Chelsea player John Dempsey was struck by Matthew's generosity when searching for funds for a cause close to his heart. I was working in a centre in Edgware for people with learning disabilities, like people who had challenge behaviour, autism, Down syndrome, and our minibus was about 18 years old and it was come to the end of its career as such, and we definitely needed a new bus. I felt that uh, Matthew Harding might be able to help us, you know, we were looking to get about 25,000 if we could, which is going to be very, very difficult. And I said, we were looking for like any contribution, donations of it's 500, whatever. And his reaction was straight away that I will definitely get you the minibus, which dumbfounded me, really, because I was just hoping for a small donation. I didn't expect a new bus. Matthew did have some problems at Chelsea. Famously, he did not get on with Ken Bates and the fallout eventually saw him and his family being barred from the director's box. Very difficult time and uh, playing piggy in the middle was very, very draining. I did at the time an article in the programme which uh, gave the virtues of both sides and appealing for them to uh, come together. But right until the end, uh, the animosity was there. There was jealousy, there was envy. Everything was uh, thrown in there. Because Matthew was probably uh, younger and closer to my age, I think Ken thought I was in his camp and he had... But no, it was just... I was in no one's camp. I was the manager of the club at the, at the time and it was, it was difficult at times to be caught in the middle. But at the end of the day, I had to get 
my head down and, and, and think about the football side and, and get that right. I think when Dad actually got thrown out of the director's box. He then he joined us, us. so it's almost like we were already there. there. Back to the olden days it was when we could sit next to each other in the, in the crowd and enjoy the day and uh, yeah, it was really weird having people chanting weird. his name. Yeah. And, it still is now, isn't it? It still is now. It puts yeah. a lump it's in my throat. Yeah, yeah. It's emotional, yeah, it's emotional. It's lovely to think that fans still think of him. And you know, the fact they sing his name is lovely. Harding saw Hoddle as the man to take Chelsea forward, so when England came calling, Matthew did all he could to convince him to stay. When um, Glenn Hoddle was offered the England uh, managership in um, uh, 96, he, uh, he had meetings, he was camped out in an hotel near Ascot trying to persuade uh, Glenn to stay. I was happy as anyone at, at Chelsea, really happy. I had a plan, we were progressing, we had these players coming in, I had a vision for what we wanted to go to the next level, Matthew had that. But you know, when your country comes calling, it's a t it was a tough decision, it really was, but in the end I, I said to him, you've really got to understand, you know, and I, I reversed it on him a little bit, because he was really passionate about me staying. He said, you know, money's no option that for you or whatever, we're going to put money into the club, I've got a vision to... And um, in the end, I said, look, if, if, some, if you've been striving for something and there's something in your business, in your insurance business or wherever it is, and it's the very top that you can go and someone's offering it to you, surely wouldn't you think about it? Wouldn't you do it? And then he went, I see where you're coming from. Nowadays, Matthew's grandchildren are the latest in a long line of Hardings to come to Chelsea. Fourth generation of Chelsea fans to come to Stamford Bridge after our granddad, who from Hayward Seath was based here, in the, in the Second World War, in the Chelsea barracks, and would come to Chelsea on his days off at the army barracks, and um, that's how the whole family first got into it, I suppose. He, he would have taken Dad when Dad was young, and then Dad took us, and now we're taking our children. So uh, the journey continues. A really, really lovely man, very humble, really easy to get on with. He, was, he could be jolly, he could be very serious, and he could be cantankerous, but a great character. Everyone will see him as a true fan. He, he loved this club to bits, he really did. And before matches, as you all know, he, he used to go over the pub and, and be with the fans and then sneak over in his jeans and stuff, get changed and put his tie and his uh, suit on to, for the last hour before the kickoff. I think he'll always be remembered, and it's, it's fantastic that the stand is still always going to make us remember him when you come to Stamford Bridge.